Praise the Lord. Greetings to each one of you in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It is a, a joy to be in the midst of God's people, worshiping our Savior in spirit and in truth. Hallelujah. For today's meditation, let us turn to Ephesians chapter 4, 17 through 24. Ephesians chapter 4, 17 through 24. And I'm going to read from the NLT version. With the Lord's authority, I say this. Live no longer as Gentiles do, for they are hopelessly confused. Their minds are full of darkness. They wander far from the life God gives because they have closed their minds and hardened their hearts against him. They have no sense of shame. They live for lustful pleasure and eagerly practice every kind of impurity. Verse 20, but that isn't what you learned about Christ. Since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him, throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Put on your new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. Hallelujah. The title of my message is Learning from Christ. Learning from Christ. So when we look at this passage, uh, although there's so much we can talk about the background, that's not where uh, I'll be focusing on today. But we can see that Paul in verse 17, he's describing the mindset of unbelieving Gentiles. He's concerned that even in the church, that this Gentile, unbelieving Gentile mindset is in the individuals, in the church itself, and they are still sticking with their old lifestyle, or they're adopting the unbelievers, Gentiles' way of life. Now, if you look at those verses 17 through 19, there are some things that we can see that, the gen, that these Gentiles are hopelessly confused. Their minds are full of darkness. They are, they're wandering far from the life that God gives because why because they have closed their minds their hearts are being hardened they are not willing to accept sound teaching they have no sense of shame they're shameless in their activity and what are they living for they're living for lustful pleasure and they're eagerly not not they're not struggling they're eagerly practicing every kind of impurity so, you know, if, as Paul was able to diagnose, and we see that in verse 20, the root cause behind this hypocrisy and the spiritual bankruptcy that he noticed, noticed among these believers is that they haven't adequately learned from Christ. Many times we tend to, you know, when we talk about people who may have left from the faith who, or might be backsliding, you might say, oh man, that person is that person, you know, the, the, his grandfather was the, so-and-so, so, his father was so-and-so, so. he goes to this church, or she goes to this church, I cannot believe. You know, and so this kind of motivation sometimes seeps in our heart that we, are, we ought to behave well because we are the children or grandchildren of somebody that, is, that was a man of God or a woman of God, and, and that becomes our motivation. We think that is how we can discipline our children. This is, that's how we can motivate people for good, good, good behavior, but... Paul knows that none of this is what matters, but the root cause is what? In verse 18, that it is about knowing Christ. It is, it is an indication that the, these people do not know Christ. So he's asking in them in verse 20, but isn't, that isn't what you learned from Christ. He's saying, since you have heard and you have learned the truth that comes from him, they have heard teachings. They have read the word. They, they, they have countless uh, services that they attended. Yet their actions don't speak to this reality that, they, that has been instilled in them over these years. That they are, have not learned about Christ. What, and for us here today, it's essentially it's what is in this word hasn't come into our mind. And what is in our mind hasn't come into our heart. And what is in our heart hasn't been bringing lasting fruit. This is the problem that is at hand. And so 
here's a mind-blowing truth in all these things. Is that God the Father sent his only begotten son. And as some of the many, many of the ancient creeds say, this son is the God of God, the light of light, the very God of very God, the begotten. He's begotten, not made, one in being in the Father. This son was sent into the sinful world in human flesh. Why? He was sent to become our salvation. Yes, of course. He was sent to become our righteousness by living for 33 and a half years. Yes, of course. But also he was sent to teach us. He became rabbi at the age of 30. Teaching and preaching the kingdom of God all over the land of Judea and Samaria. Or parts of uh, Judea, uh, extended out to Judea. For three and a half years before he obeyed finally the, the father's will to lay down his life for us. Jesus is the greatest teacher to ever live. And from this greatest teacher, Paul is saying, but all this thing that I'm seeing you doing, this isn't what you learned from this great teacher, Jesus Christ. So why was it important for Jesus to to have this teaching ministry of three and a half years? It is because it, it was, you know, Jesus, all Jesus did, right, was doing the Father's will, right? It wasn't, Jesus' part-time job to do something else while his, the only will was to die on the cross. It was, he was doing the Father's will in every step, every moment, and it was in the Father's will that he not only saved the lost, but he also teach and transform the lost into his image through his actions, through his words, through his teachings. And for this transformation to happen in the, in the people that Jesus was speaking to, what means did God use to speak to them. He used the most, now time, that now they call the most boring form of communication, which is what I'm doing right now. It's the word of, the, the messaging, <laughs> speaking through the word of mouth. Why do we have multiple messages? Why do we have uh, exhortations? Why do we have Bible readings? Why do we have these meetings? This is part and parcel of God's intention for us. This is how he has commanded us to be transformed. It's through the delivery of the God's word through fallen beings like you and me that have, been, that have been filled by God's grace, that have been saved and set free. This is how God intended his people to worship and to proclaim his timeless truth, to believe in his son and, and be saved. That's why, that's why Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the good news. Go and talk to people. Go and preach. It wasn't 10-step programs or uh, philanthropical programs. It was about preaching the gospel. Talk to them about me. Teach them about me. Everything that I have taught you, teach them. So it is important when, when we minister from God's word in whatever format, whether it's in a Sunday school class, whether it is uh, in, among peers when you're studying the word together or it's an opportunity like this, it is important that we go to the crux of the matter of these things. Just as Paul went to the root of the matter, that they, that telling them that they do not know Christ. It is not about behavior modification. It is not about guilting people into positive action. It's about going to the crux of the matter is that do you know Jesus? Because there's only two statuses for all the people in the world, whether you are in Christ or you're outside of Christ. Either you're in Christ or you're outside of Christ. So that is a question for us to ask ourselves. Am I in Christ or am I outside of Christ? Because there's no category for good people. There's no category for people with good intentions as humanly speaking. And as for listeners, it is important for us to listen carefully, right? To keenly hear his voice to the word, however it is presented. I readily admit, I'm not a professional. I readily admit, I have shortcomings. I, I shake up here. I, I, I don't have all my words the flowing out of my mouth. But through my weakness and through the weaknesses of many ministers that are up here, 
we have to keenly listen and hear for the voice of God. Because that is what makes a difference in determining your transformation today. Every day we are given the opportunity to transform from one image of glory to the next. From one, the one image of Christ to the next greater image. As we understand more about Jesus through the word of God being preached. And as we, under, as we hear the word of Christ, Jesus becomes more and more real to us. Sometimes it's about hearing the same thing over and over again until it clicks. And those timings come by the power of the Holy Spirit as He opens our eyes to see more of Jesus in context of maybe some of the circumstances that are going on in your life. It might be some word that is said here that you thought about in your devotion. It might be some situation that you went through and then the per person on stage brings a Bible word speaking directly to that situation. This is how God speaks. It is not in the cleverness. It is not in the, in the prettiness of words. It is through weak people taking this word, interpreting it correctly, and sharing it with the original power and purity. Hallelujah. So I want to stick on this team on learning from Christ. And I, for the time that is ahead of me, I'm going to bring two incidences in Jesus' life. One, one is in his early life, and another is in the last moments of his earthly life. So for the first incident, let's go to Luke chapter 2, 41 to 52. If you can lower the volume on the stage, please. Luke chapter 2, 41 through 52. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feet of, feast of Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up according to custom. And when the feast was ended, and as they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents did not know it, but supposing him to be in the group, they went a day's journey and then began to search for him among their relatives and acquaintances. And when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem searching for him. And after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. And when his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in, in great distress. And he said to them, Why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? And they did not understand the saying that he spoke to them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. And his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. And verse 52, And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in the favor with God and man. This is such a, a familiar story for each one of us. It, it really, uh, it's very straightforward. But what we see here is that, um, you know, of all the stories that could be highlighted about Jesus, especially in his, in his age of understanding uh, good and bad, and, and as he's growing up and almost becoming a teenager, this is the one story that the Holy Spirit, uh, Holy Spirit uh, led Luke to highlight uh, for us, and this is when he was 12 years old. How many of you are here 12 years old? I don't, I see one hand. All right, Luke. Luke, the author of Luke. All right. Um, this is, so this puts us in some perspective. Don't compare Luke with Jesus, of course, but we all have been 12 years old at some point in our life, those who are older than that. Here's 12, Jesus who was 12 years old, who we see in scripture that he's increasing in wisdom and stature in favor with God and man up to that age. Now when we look at his parents, the, his parents, uh, especially Mary, received a promise. And then uh, over the course of 12 years, based on the, the response that we see from the parents, they may have forgotten some aspects of it. They, they, they remember the, the miraculous way that, you know, the angel came and, and how God led them faithfully through the, all the trials. Um, and so 12 years later, 
when Jesus does this, which I would suggest that he's not doing this in rebellion of his parents. There just wasn't any clear communication. That was the only issue there. So Jesus, growing in stature and wisdom, Jesus, the the four-year-old and five-year-old, was matching up according to the fully realized five-year-old and four-year-old. So imagine a five-year-old, four-year-old without sin, and then he's growing up to being 12, and now he's very inquisitive. He, he has questions. He has, he's, he's starting to, the, the learning that he is taking. I mean, this is just mind-blowing that God of glory humbling himself in a human being and learning in the process as a human being. He has a lot of questions. He's learning scripture. He's very inquisitive. He's, he's going in the depths that, that we see here. The teachers are amazed by the, his understanding. I mean, to ask good questions... You have to have a good understanding, right? The more you understand, the better questions you have. So Jesus has really good understanding. And sometimes, and this is just an encouragement for us all, really, but for, especially for those who are younger, is that do not let anybody limit you from searching more about Christ and more from the Scriptures. There is, a, there is an assumption that sometimes, oh, that's, he's a kid. She's a kid. She doesn't know anything. Let's teach them about David and Goliath. Again, because they don't remember what they learned last week. I'm not uh, not putting that as as a negative aside, but I'm saying that that we need to challenge the notion that our children cannot learn and say that, you know what, we need to raise the standard of our teaching in the home, in the church, in the Sunday school to see how far they can reach. If we can challenge them and take, you know, have them learn calculus at the age of 12, they can also have them learn theology at the age of 12, that is what I believe, is that, you know, the rising tide raises all boats, right? Like that you, as you raise the standards of, of teaching God's word and, and not sugarcoating it for, for too long, right? Many young kids need that. But then when, as they are understanding like advanced concept and as they are understanding human nature, as they are asking very deep questions about, you know, very impo- emotionally intelligent, all these are ways for us to to, get, to know that now they are ready to understand questions regarding the human condition, our fallen condition, why we need a Savior, and, and go into Scripture and show how that God has been teaching us through the Old Testament and New Testament and showing us in bits and pieces this, the Messiah that is to come. We need to raise our standards for our children. And now for children, what does this mean in terms of obeying parents? Especially in young people, not just children, you know. With, with us um, Malayalis, uh, that age, is, it, it, we don't have a set age on that. Uh, I think legally it's 18, but for, uh, I know that I lived with my parents when I was tw- till I was 26. Um, and many of you are sort of in that similar stage where you're trying to understand, you know, whether it's at marriage and all that. I, it's, it's, it's between you and your parents to talk about that. But... Um, but what I'm getting to is this, that what does it mean for us children and growing young adults who are still in the authority of our parents? There's a verse that we all know, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1, the first verse that every parent teaches their ch- children. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. So what, is, what does this mean? What does it mean to obey in the Lord? Especially in light of, let's look at how, you know, Jesus' life, right, in the temple. Sometimes we forget that tail end of that instruction, obey in the Lord. That in the Lord, we, we, we ignore that and we, what we hear is, blindly obey your parents. No questions asked. And now there, there are some areas where you just have to do that. There w- wisdom just to blindly obey because your parents know a lot more than you know. It doesn't matter their the level of uh, knowledge of pop culture or English or whatever it may be. They have been through life for so long that sometimes what they have to s- tell you to do is based on the mistakes they have made or mistakes they have seen others make. They're trying to, trying to cut, sh- cut, have a shortcut to help you flourish. They, want, they, re- they rejoice with you when they see you flourish. And sometimes the harshness and the strictness comes from the desire to see you trust them 
in, 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 in what they're trying to advise to you. And, and so that is there. But that is not the full instruction. The full instruction in obeying in the Lord, it involves Jesus. Okay, the, what, what Paul is saying is as you are in the Lord, as you are walking with Jesus, as you're being transformed with Jesus, obey Jesus just as you obey your parents. Or obey, Jesus, or obey your parents just as you obey Jesus. Both ways work. But in difficult situations where you cannot understand why your parents are telling you to do something that you don't, uh, uh, you don't understand or you don't agree with. If you are walking with Jesus and if you know that he is planning out your life and he is with you in every circumstance, trust in Jesus and obey your parents just and say, Jesus, I'm obeying my parents even if I disagree with them because I want to obey you. I don't agree with them, but Lord, I, I believe that you have the power to change their heart. So you say a prayer. And you, by faith, you obey your parents. And there's a, there are circumstances, I have to say this, we, we are a blessed church, but there are circumstances where your parents might tell you to sin. Now, maybe not big sin, but may, it might be something like, hey, lie to that person. Or, or say something that is not the truth. Now you have the choice to say no to that because that is not part of this command. That's why we say obey in the Lord means that your allegiance is not primarily to your parents. Your allegiance is to Jesus. Just as Jesus' allegiance was not to his earthly parents but it was to God the Father. So that's why he stayed in the temple. See what I'm saying? So he, he, he was fully in step with his father's will. He did not... Verbally, he did not explicitly disobey his parents because there was no express command to, do, to, to come with them. But then once they came to him, then they says that he left with them. He didn't say, you guys can go, I'll meet you there, <laughs> you know, in five days. And he didn't say that, right? He left and he was submissive to them. Now, the second circumstance, and I'll be quick with this one, is in John chapter 13, 1 through 17. And I, I, I'm highlighting these very simple concepts so that when we look at Scripture, we are able to look in ourselves as well and make changes in our life. John chapter 13, 1 through 17, it says here, It was before, just before the pa Passover festival, Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world. He loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. Could you picture that with me as I read this? After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Verse 12, when he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to the place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now, now that I am, I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a, a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Verse 17, now that you know these things, you'll be blessed if you do them. There's so many things that we can say here. here uh, you know, the, the, as we know, the disciples often had arguments about who was the greatest. They, they tried to already... Uh, reserve seats in the kingdom, the right and left hand seat of Christ. Their motivation was when Jesus reigns, where am I going to be? Am I going to be the leader? Am I going to be in the right and left hand seat? I, you know, they're already planning out, and as they say, you know, you're, you're, you're measuring the curtains and everything like that, but they're completely 
completely out of their minds. So Jesus perceiving all these things, what, what really hit me hard is that he knew that his time was coming to an end. And he loved them. Verse 2 says, or verse 1, he, he loved them to the end. He knew Judas was there. And, and, and at, this, at the same time, devil was prompting Judas to betray Jesus. And this is what really struck me. Verse 3, Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, that he had come from God and was returning to God. I mean, think about that. That Father had put all things under his power, that he had come from God and is returning to God. I mean, this is the pinnacle of, of Jesus' understanding. And he, he knows that he is God, that he is going to be glorified, that all things are going to be under his feet upon him defeating Satan uh, and, and, and take carrying all the sins on the cross. At that moment, what did he do? Did he go on, to a, uh, on a rant, a tirade, talking about how great he is? Or what did he do? He took off his outer clothes. He wrapped around a towel around his waist. He got on his knees. He started washing the dirty feet of the disciples one by one. How amazing is God? And how come we have failed to emulate this Jesus? There's a clear blessing in verse 17. He says, now that you know these things, you'll be blessed if you do them. There's a blessing in store for you if you imitate Christ. I'm not saying you have to wash feet and all that. I'm talking about the heart of the matter. Is that if you have a servant attitude, especially when the, you um, glory upon glory is paced upon you, uh, as people pr praise you and say, you're the best in the world. There's a choice you can make at that moment. You can... You can retweet and, and propose, make them even more out in the world. Or you take a step back and you follow the example of Christ. You go to the person that you know, every one of us know who is least among us. I'm sorry, I, I, that is a, a human thing. that we Go to that person and become even lower than them. That's how I think about it. Because that's, that's what Jesus did here. Because Judas is at the moment the, maybe the, the enemy number one in a very human sense. He washed Judas' feet as well. Now that act doesn't mean much to us to nowadays because we, you know, we wear shoes and socks and I, I think that's a conspiracy because of this foot washing thing and somebody wanted to stop it and somebody came to a meeting wearing shoes and socks and it, no, no, I'm just kidding. But, yeah. But, but I, I, what I'm saying here is this, that, you know, this, this uh, allowed, the, I mean, what we know about the foot washing is that this was, this was dedicated for the, for the servants or those at least in the household to do. And for Jesus to do that tells us a lot about the nature of God himself. I think we have missed understanding the nature of God. Philippians chapter 2, 3 and 5 says this, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. Verse 5, Having this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, that we can by faith receive a transformed mind so that, you know, I don't know if it's a Malayali mindset, but whatever mindset that constantly makes us want to uh, make, create ranks and priorities and say, I am at this status, so, so I need to be treated at this level. All those need to be put to death because that is not the mind of Christ. That is not the way in which we have learned Christ. Since my time is up, I'm, I'm going to wrap up here. I invite the worship team to come forward. The picture I had in the title, uh, me, me, title of the message is the 
It's a depiction of Mary, the sister of, of Lazarus, sitting at the feet of Jesus. And, and Jesus told Martha that Mary has chosen the, the better thing. Mary understood what the priority was. Just as Jesus went to the temple, uh, uh, you know, and stayed longer at the age of 12, and he didn't go back home immediately, Mary also chose what, what was better. We, from this picture, you can see Mary is humble, teachable. She's open to hear every word coming out of Jesus. In comparison, her sister, although she has good intentions, she was distracted. Like she, she was anxious. She was worried about many things. She, she just didn't have a clear mind. Her heart was full with worries and concerns, and she forgot who was in her midst. And that is the heart in which we should come before the throne of grace, every service, every time we come before the Lord, just like Mary on our knees, figuratively or literally, in humble posture, receiving from the Lord, being teachable, Lord, Lord, search me, search my heart, O God, uh, Lord, point out areas of my life in my past, O Lord, point out areas that, that I failed you, O Lord, in the past day or even today, Lord, and teach me, teach me how to become more like you. Hallelujah. There's a verse that Jesus says, Come to me, all of you, who are labor and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest in your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. How can you reject this call from Jesus? Come to me. Come to me. Let me teach you. Let me teach you. Take on my burden. Take off your heavy laden burden. Take off the burdens that you're carrying. Take, you know, let aside, put aside all the sin that is, that's, that is clinging on you and learn from me. Let me teach you. And let Jesus teach us to be truly human. To be truly human is to be full of the Spirit and walking on Jesus as, as Jesus walked. In the last part of the verses I read in Ephesians chapter 4, it says this, to throw off your old sinful nature in your former way of life. Throw it off, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Put on the new nature. Created to be like God. You can become like Jesus. That is a, that is a promise that you can. It's a process, but you can truly righteous, becoming truly righteous and holy. So let us pray before the Lord. Can we make a decision this morning? Hallelujah. I only scratched the surface. You all know that. There's vastness in, in, in the treasures and the treasury of Christ. As we heard this morning that God will give us daily manna for, for every day. And every day God will and Jesus will teach us how to, how, how, where do we fell short in certain circumstances? Or how can we, how can we take, uh, handle certain things that are to come? Let us ask of the Lord. Let us have an active relationship with Jesus, teacher to disciple. That's why we are disciples of Christ. And also, as you are involved in the church body, the pastors have a role. The teachers have a role. Sunday school teachers have a role. All of us have a role to sharpen each other in the faith, to build everybody up, to equip each other for the work of ministry. If we are active in that, if we are, in, if we have in, if we are intentional in that, I promise you that God will start transforming you from the inside out. You will notice a change in, in how you react to circumstances. You'll notice a change in how you, in your, in your anger. You'll notice a change in how you, well, at one time, had many uh, cynical attitudes about people, but now you're able to see them as God sees them. But it's a process. So let us, let us labor ourselves before the Lord and pray. Heavenly Father, we come before in Jesus' name. We ask, O oh God, that we can become your true disciples, O oh Lord. Just as Mary sat at your feet and learned, we want to learn as well. Lord, 
we know that you are the great teacher. No one can teach us just, uh, just like you do. And we're also thankful that you have appointed, Lord, ministers and pastors and teachers in this church, oh Lord, to share the word of God to us in bite-sized portions. But Lord, we also, God, want to interact with you daily in person to person, oh Lord. We want to lay aside every preconceived notions about uh, our walk with you and just come before you just as we are, Lord, in humility, with openness, with a teachable spirit. We praise you and thank you for all you have done, O oh Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Can we all stand for-